Um, how many of you know what Zool is? Okay, that half of the room. Um, oh, and, and Robert. Um, great, and uh, how many of you saw something like this talk last year? All right, excellent. Um, so, uh, my name is James Blair. I work for the OpenStack Foundation, and I'm a core member of the uh, infrastructure team for the project. Um, which means that I and the other members of uh, the team that I'm on are responsible for the, the, all of the systems that the developers use uh, when working on the OpenStack project, aside from their own systems, uh, and the continuous integration infrastructure uh, for the OpenStack project. Um, this is not a talk uh, about OpenStack. Uh, there were quite a few of those already uh, at this uh, conference. Um, what it is, is is a little bit about our development process so that uh, you you get a background uh, about what, what we're doing, why we're doing it. Um, it's about uh, a process that we call project gating, which is like continuous integration, but it's done backwards. And uh, specifically about a program called Zool, which we use to actually accomplish that. Um, and finally, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the, the directions that we're heading with Zool uh, in the future. Um, so as I said, this isn't a talk about OpenStack. So uh, really quickly, I'll talk about OpenStack. Um, <laughs> it is open source software for building public and private clouds. Um, so if you, uh, um, you know, if, uh, the Rackspace Public Cloud, HP Public Cloud, both uh, run on this software. Um, you guys probably know what um, what uh, infrastructure as, as a service in cloud computing are. Um, but basically, you can get uh, compute nodes, networking setups, um, block and object storage, and the like, all um, on demand with some just uh, some API calls. Um, OpenStack is it is one project that's created, uh, that, sorry, that has um, a lot of component projects that make it up. Um, so there's a, there's a component to manage um, compute allocation, um, storage, networking, uh, identity management, uh, et cetera. Uh, so uh, each of these uh, projects is its own Git repository with its own developer community. And, um, but at the end of the day, we have to take every one of these, put them together, and uh, end up with something that looks like a coherent and working system. So um, as I mentioned, there's a, a, a pretty diverse uh, development community overall, um, as well as working on each of the individual projects. Um, you can get a rough idea of what we're dealing with here with uh, contributors from lots of major corporations, um, all uh, working on um, working on the project uh, ideally together. Um, so uh, basically, a lot of our a lot of the challenges that we deal with are related to the fact that we have this massively distributed uh, developer community, and um, we're 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 trying to facilitate the operation of the project as a whole for all of these people. Um, one of the things that we do to try to accomplish that is to use consistent tooling. So um, centrally, we, we run this continuous integration system uh, that all of the patches to all the projects uh, get run through. Um, and uh, we have another, a number of other tools uh, that we've built out as well uh, to, uh, to manage um, Jenkins configurations to help developers submit changes for code review and things like that. Um, but one of the biggest things that we do to facilitate uh, developers working together and producing something that functions is project gating. Um, so this is the idea that um, before any change lands to uh, any of the Git repositories, uh, it has to pass all of the tests that we have for the project as a whole. Um, the reason for this is, um, one, it's, it's, it's to make sure that uh, OpenStack actually works. Uh, if you 
it's, it's a very complicated uh, system and it's pretty easy to, to make a change that due to the interaction of all of these different uh, parts would, would, would cause it to break and you know, um, just the little bit that you're working on might still work, but, but as a whole, uh, it might stop working. Um, so it's to make sure that we always have working code in the repository. So, and again, if you have um, as many developers as we do, uh, if you have you know, a couple, a few hundred developers who all um, check out the, you know, they, they get up in the morning, they check out the latest copy of the repository, it would be really great if that worked. Um, so project gating helps ensure that. It means that when you, when you start your work, you're, you're ideally not fixing um, the bug that somebody else committed last night. Um, and it makes it egalitarian. We, we have no, um, uh, nobody in the project can uh, just merge a change and bypass, bypass this test system. Uh, every change for every project uh, submitted by anyone goes through the same uh, code review and the same gating system to make sure that that change passes all of its tests before it lands in trunk. Um, or lands in the Git repository. I'm going to say trunk occasionally because we 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 used to uh, we used to use bizarre, and uh, some of that terminology sticks with you. Um, everything is automated. We um, we I don't know, we 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 hate doing work by hand. Uh, we have computers to do it for us. So uh, all of this testing is automated. Um, all of our uh, release process is automated. Um, it, you, you can actually, this is, this is kind of a teaser for, um, for our, the main status screen for Zool. And you can, you can already get an idea that not only are we running a lot of tests, but we have facilities to, uh, to, to manage documentation builds and release artifacts and things like that, which I'll get into later. Uh, no, but, I'm sorry? You know, so we can't just have small PowerPoint. Well, right, yeah. Well, e even, even now, it, it goes off the screen a bit. But yeah, I'll, I'll show the real one in a minute. And, and uh, the numbers are larger right at this moment. Um, so really quickly, our, our, uh, the process flow for a developer uh, in, is um, it's, a, it's a fairly typical uh, Git process flow, but it's, um, it, it's uh, we have a couple of of unique aspects to it. Um, there's, uh, so you start by um, cloning a copy of, so Nova is the code name for our uh, compute uh, system. So if you're gonna work on Nova, you, you start by cloning a copy of the Nova Git repository into your local environment. Um, we recommend all of, all of our developers uh, use a branching model when they're, uh, when they're working. So um, create a new branch off of master. Um, say if you're fixing a bug, you, you, you write that fix and you commit to your local branch. Um, ideally, you run tests, but honestly, we have this huge system for running tests, so a lot of developers figure, why bother, and, and they just uh, commit it and throw it at it and see what happens. Uh, so anyway, um, once it's uh, uh, committed, um, you can run a program called git review, which is a git subcommand that we wrote for dealing with Garrett, our uh, code review system, which I'll talk about in a minute. But uh, at any rate, this simple command takes your commit and sends it up to Garrett for code review. And um, that's really all there is to it as far as what you have to do locally. So it's, it's actually a pretty lightweight process to, to interact with all the machinery that I'm, I'm going to talk about. Once it's on Garrett, uh, developers review it and uh, Jenkins uh, via Zool uh, is going to test those, uh, your, your change and report whether or not it works. If it doesn't or if the developers don't like it, uh, you should probably uh, change it and amend your commit, push it back up again, go through the process again. Once uh, Jenkins and, your, and the core reviewers like a change, uh, they can approve it for merging. Then it goes through one last round of testing, and uh, this is what we call the gating process. This is where, um, right before the change lands in the repository, uh, we test it one more time. Basically because this process might have taken a while. Um, it it might have taken a couple of hours, it might have taken a couple of weeks. Either way, the velocity on the project as a whole is so great that the test results that we had when you uploaded your change are 
frankly irrelevant now. Um, we can't trust that that it's still going to work, even though it worked three hours ago. So uh, the gating system makes sure that when that change actually is about to land, uh, it's it's really going to work. Um, if it does, it ends up in the um, the Git repository. So um, Garrett, as you saw from the previous slide, um, is pretty important to this process. It's a standalone code review system written by uh, Google for the Android open source project, uh, and it seems to be increasing in adoption with a lot of open source projects. Uh, some of them aren't even uh, at Google. Um, it is really flexible, which is one of the reasons we like it. Uh, it has, um, uh, you can do queries against it and get information out of it with uh, JSON. Um, you, it has hook points and uh, it has this really nifty event stream where you can SSH into it and it just uh, spits out little blobs of JSON at you telling you everything that's going on. Uh, so it's very extensible uh, and, and easy to hook into all of the automation that we have. Um, it also has uh, extensible review categories. So not only does, uh, do indiv are individuals able to uh, vote on a change and, and say that you know, they, they do or do not like a change, um, but also automated systems can, can leave comments uh, indicating that they've verified that something works. Uh, you could add a column that says, uh, I've done a license check on this change and it's okay. Or you know, the copyright assignment is all in order or whatever you want. Uh, it's very flexible. Um, so the, the, the life cycle of a patch is, um, you know, if you think back to that diagram, uh, once, once you've submitted a code for review, um, we, we run the tests on it. it uh, our systems decide whether or not it's verified. Um, core reviewers review the code for correctness and desirability and, and things like that. Uh, anybody can actually log into our Garrett and start reviewing patches. Um, you, can, you can do that uh, during this talk if you want, actually. Um, and, uh, but we have teams of core reviewers for every project, which are people who um, you know, are really involved in it and have shown that they understand what's going on. And uh, those core reviewers are the ones who get to decide finally whether a patch is going to go in or not. Um, once they've approved uh, a change, then the testing that I talked about goes into operation and then the patch is merged. Um, all of these points that I talked about, um, they, uh, Garrett provides uh, hook points there. Uh, it provides events uh, for um, all of these states that we can trigger actions off of. So whenever somebody uploads a patch, um, it emits a patch set uploaded event. Um, there's a change merged event. Uh, whenever somebody leaves a comment or leaves a, re a review vote, that, um, that emits an, an event as well. And um, finally, if somebody pushes a tag or, uh, uh, or if any of the branch refs in Git are updated, um, emits, uh, it emits events for that as well. Uh, so we can, we can use all of these and Zool or even other systems can, uh, can, can perform actions based on those. So as a developer, this is what, uh, what the result of the test system looks like. So when you've submitted a change, um, you, you can see there's actually a lot of comments up there from, uh, from real people. Uh, um, People, people with names like Johannes and John are real. Uh, things with names like Smokestack and Jenkins are, are not. Um, anyway, at the bottom you can see what Jenkins, how Jenkins reports its results back to, uh, to Garrett. And uh, each of those uh, job names here is a link to the, to the logs. Uh, and then of course over on the right we have um, you know, whether or not that the, the job was successful. So developers can come back and they can see, you know, in this case, that. Um, the dev stack test for, um, for their change failed, and so they can click here and, um, and go look at the logs and uh, ideally figure out why. So um, we use Jenkins to run our tests. Um, a, we run a few different types of jobs in Jenkins. Uh, there's the, the gate tests, which are the things that I just showed you that decide whether or not something uh, is, is working and able to merge. Um, our, af after we merge a change, 
Uh, we have some automation that builds docs and publishes them to docs.openstack.org. Uh, we build tarballs and publish them to tarballs.openstack.org. Uh, and for our Python projects, we, we upload um, uh, Python packages to PyPy automatically as well. Um, we have uh, a couple of different ways to work on uh, jobs while they're in the development phase. We have an, a system to create experimental jobs so that people can, can say, well, I, I want to start testing Nova with Postgres. Um, so I'm going to write a job that does that, but I don't actually want to bother any other developers yet. Uh, so they can, they can do that in this system as well. Um, when, when that starts to work, um, at all, really, uh, we can we can move a job into a silent um, configuration so that it runs quite a lot, but still doesn't report anything back. So you can collect data on what does this what does this look like when we run it all the time, uh, and then finally, when we're about ready to uh, actually expose a job to developers, we can put it in a non-voting mode where it runs and um, and, and reports its result back, but even if it fails, it's still not going to block anything. Um, so that increases the, the visibility and, and gets it out in front of developers. And finally, we have um, periodic jobs, uh, jobs that we run every night. So these are, um, we check our stable branches for bit rot because they might, they might have not seen a change merged in a while. Um, we update images that we use um, and we run uh, some very long tests that we can't run in the gating system. Um, so uh, the, the engine that we use to drive all of this is called Zool, and it's something that we wrote um, within the, the OpenStack infrastructure project. And it, um, it interfaces with Garrett and Jenkins or other systems, and uh, I'll talk about that in a bit. Um, it's very flexible. Uh, it, it allows for a lot of different kinds of project automation. Some of the, some of the things that I just talked about are, are things that we, we actually didn't even anticipate when we wrote Zool. Uh, we just found that because we didn't build in too many assumptions about what we were going to do with it, we found we could do a lot of things with it. Um, and um, it allows parallel testing of serialized changes. Uh, so uh, I'm going to really dig into that in a minute, but that's basically uh, how we're able to test every single change to the project and, uh, and still keep up some kind of a velocity. Um, so basically, ideally what we would like to do with the project is um, somebody approves a change and uh, then we test it, and then we merge it, and we do that one at a time, one after another, uh, as people approve changes. Um, that's, it's fairly easy to wrap your head around that, and you could see why if you do that, you'll, you'll end up with a project that, um, that never breaks, that uh, always passed, uh, passes tests. And, um, but our tests take about 40 minutes, 45, 50 minutes to run. Um, that varies depending on um, uh, well, a number of different factors, but um, so you could see that, say, you know, on the order of an hour, if your tests take on the order of an hour, then you could only merge 24 changes in a day, and you saw how many projects we have, and so that's, that's clearly not going to work uh, with any kind of velocity. So um, we, we sort of took a page from, you know, Pentium processor design, right, and, and looked into uh, speculative execution where we could say, well, let's, let's, um, test this, um, we'll test the first change, and then we'll start testing the change after that with the assumption that the first change is going to pass all of its tests. And you can keep doing that, and you can keep stacking the changes on uh, one on top of the other. And as long as uh, all of the changes end up passing, then this sort of future you've predicted where you know uh, each of those changes is going to merge um, will come to pass and everything's fine. Uh, as it turns out, if one of those changes fails, um, then, then your prediction has, is wrong and you have to discard the work that you've done and recalculate it. Um, so for those um, visual uh, people like I am, uh, I've got a little sort of illustration of how this works. So if you have um, two projects, say Nova and Keystone, and um, this is, 
these little dots here represent the head of the Git repositories for, for each of those. And then um, somebody comes along and, and starts approving some changes. So somebody, somebody says, I'm ready to merge change number one to Nova. And then somebody says, I'm ready to merge change number two to Nova. And then, then somebody approves a change to Keystone. And then finally another change to Nova, right? So you've, you've got these four changes that have all been approved. And they all need to merge into these Git repositories. So what Zool does is it queues them up in order uh, as people submit them. Um, and you'll notice that Keystone and Nova are both in this queue. Um, and that's because, um, like I said earlier, these projects all have to work together. So it's possible to merge a change to Keystone that breaks Nova. So that means that if you're going to, to test these changes, you need to test them all together. And so Zool builds, Zool actually automatically identifies which projects um, have these relationships with each other based on the fact that they share a test in Jenkins. And, um, and, and so it, it forms them into a single queue where all of the, the changes uh, um, uh, are, are lined up for testing. So uh, basically, as soon as these changes are in queued, Zool starts uh, telling Jenkins to, um, to start running tests for them. So it, you know, as, as you can see, they, they, all, they all went in about the same time. They all started running tests about the same time. Uh, and, and they might have finished at different times, but they're all finished now. Um, so uh, then Zool looks at the results for, um, for, um, for each of those changes. And, and it sees that um, change number three failed its test, right? So number four was in queued behind change number three, that, which means that when number four was running, it, it was testing um, Nova with the Nova repository with changes one, two, and four applied. And it was also testing Keystone uh, with change number three applied. So it was basically, it was testing that change with the assumption that every change ahead of it was going to pass. But it didn't, change number three failed. So at that point, the results that it had for four are no longer valid. So it, it cancels any jobs that are still running and discards those results. And it reorders the queue. So three is still behind number two because no, no other changes have, uh, have failed uh, ahead of it. But um, four gets re-enqueued behind number two because that's the most uh, recent, the, the nearest change ahead of it that hasn't failed. And so Zool then restarts the changes for, for number four. Um, this time, uh, the tests for number four pass. So that probably illustrates the fact that number four was broken because number three was broken. So you can see that at this point, the, the best thing to do is to just kick three out of the queue, send it back to the developer, and, and say, hey, you, you, something, something went wrong. You need to, to fix your, your patch. Um, so mm -hmm. when one of the long-running things fails, does that mean that the patch after it sort of may be like 90% of the way through its run, and something ahead of it has failed, so it goes, right, discard, and move. Yes. Right. Yeah. So that means that you could potentially have a patch that is always stuck behind something that is doing fails and moves up the tree. Um, yes. Okay. So uh, to, re re to repeat the question, uh, it was it was uh, that if you if you have uh, a a patch that's failing, like for instance Keystone number three here, um, as uh, as that moves up the tree, won't the changes that are behind it keep getting uh, canceled and discarded? And, and, and in this case, Zool is doing extra work. And, and the answer is yes, that is the case. Um, ideally, if, uh, it, ideally, changes don't move up the tree in the way that you're, you're discussing. Yes, it, it, it did, right? But at this point, three is, uh, is out of consideration. Um, Zool has decided it's not going to merge, so it's not going to put any more tests behind it. So at this point, uh, at least in this illustration, uh, three isn't going to affect anything behind it anymore. It, it had a chance once, uh, and it screwed up. And so uh, it doesn't get another chance for a while. Uh, there are conditions where it could it could have another chance, but 
at least for the purposes of this illustration, it doesn't in this case. So it's out of commission and, uh, and time to move on. And there's another question in the back. Yeah, so similar kind of question. Uh, so because the run times are a little variable, presumably you can get a case where say three has failed, but two is still running. Yes. Um, and so in that case, would Nova, would say four get it, still get the queue behind two, which is still in progress? Yes, so the question was, uh, because the times are variable, uh, presumably a, a change, um, a change further down in the queue could finish before a change ahead of it has finished running tests. And the answer is yes, that happens. And, and in this case, if, if two were still running its tests, n number four would be in queued behind two. So it's, it's, it's being as optimistic as possible. It's, it's assuming that anything that hasn't failed yet is succeeding. So, so um, now, uh, Change number one has passed all of its tests. It's at the head of the queue, so it gets to merge. Change number two is now at the head of the queue. Uh, there's nothing ahead of it, uh, and it's passed, so it gets to merge. Um, change number three is still sticking around, because basically because of the, the thing that you just said. There is a possibility that three might have failed because two was about to fail. It didn't happen in this case. But if, if two were still running and three had failed, Zool's going to keep three around just in case it decides that it actually has to restart three because two failed. But that didn't happen. Three is now at the head of the queue, uh, and it has failed, so we just discard it. Um, and finally, four is at the head of the queue, and it can merge. Uh, so we have um, uh, a concept that's pretty central to Zool is the idea of a pipeline. Uh, each of these changes gets enqueued into a pipeline, and we have a number of different pipelines defined for, um, for OpenStack. Uh, let me actually just switch over to the, the actual status page real quick. Um, so you, you can see um, for uh, in the check pipeline right now, there's a whole bunch of tests running. Uh, there's the gate pipeline, which of course is the the, the thing that I just described. Um, I'll talk about why this looks so weird in just a minute. Um, there's the post pipeline, which happens when um, uh, once a job merges, uh, changes end up in the post pipeline to, to do things like build docs and, and, and whatnot. Uh, whenever something gets tagged, it shows up in the tag pipeline. Uh, these things build um, uh, release artifacts and publish them. Uh, there's the silent pipeline, which runs jobs that uh, we don't want anybody to see. The experimental pipeline, it's similar. Uh, it runs jobs that aren't ready for prime time yet, but they do actually report back in a non-voting manner. And then finally, the periodic jobs, jobs that we run uh, once a night or so. Um, and, and actually, you can see there's, there's a little bit of a, uh, a relationship here between uh, what I, the animation that I just showed and what the queue actually looks like. And, and the reason why it looks so weird right now is because Zool is actually, uh, as we speak, in the middle of a reset and it's reordering the changes. And um, while I, I manage to get this looking right on an HTML page most of the time, occasionally when a reset is happening, it's, it's a little, getting all of the lines to, uh, to point to the right place without crossing each other is, is a little difficult. But at any rate, uh, you can see this is about as far down as it's gotten right now, and it's, it's reordering uh, these changes. Um, we're, we're coming up on a milestone uh, release for OpenStack, and a lot of people are in a rush to get changes in. They've basically procrastinated um, until the last minute. Uh, they, they took time off at the end of last month, um, uh, which is hard to believe. Um, but now, now they're all back and trying to get their changes in before this milestone, which is why the, the queue is currently uh, 71 changes deep. Um, but you can see uh, we've got these little sparkline graphs uh, that, that show um, it was actually deeper earlier and then a whole bunch of changes merged at once and uh, it got shallower. Um, so anyway, that's, um, these are all of the different pipelines that we have running now. Um, and uh, so Zool is configured using a, uh, a, what I hope is a fairly readable uh, YAML configuration file. 
And this is, this is where a lot of the flexibility uh, that I talked about earlier comes in. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't know the difference between a check pipeline and a gate pipeline and a experimental pipeline or things like that. Those are all um, ideas that, that you know, we're, we're using really basic primitives and building up these conceptual ideas out of it. So our definition for the check pipeline basically looks uh, almost exactly like this, which is uh, we're defining a, a pipeline. Its name is check. The independent pipeline manager is, is probably the closest we get to, to building some of these ideas into Zool. That's basically just telling Zool that the changes have no relationship to each other. It's saying don't do that thing where you order the changes and, uh, and do the speculative execution. This is just run tests for all of these as fast as you can. Um, uh, every time a patch is created in Garrett, uh, it, that change should be enqueued into this pipeline. Uh, and if the jobs succeed, then you should report back to Garrett with a verified one vote. Uh, if they fail, report back with a verified minus one. Uh, and then finally, the precedence up there, uh, we actually have a, a couple of different queues. Um, and, and so you can specify that changes in this pipeline have a, a you know, low, medium, or high precedence. So, so the jobs can jump to the, the front of the queue if you, if you need. The gate pipeline is very similar, uh, except that it has a, a couple of extra things. Um, first of all, it's, it's triggered on a common added event in Garrett um, where somebody leaves an approved vote. So the, the actual thing that causes um, uh, Zool to enqueue this change is, is somebody leaving an approved vote in the, in, in the approved review category. Um, and when it starts, it reports that to Garrett because we, we like to actually have a little bit of feedback um, to users saying, you know, yes, this is being enqueued. And it clears out any previous votes that, um, that Zool might have left, um, perhaps in the, the check pipeline. Um, and then uh, finally, if uh, the changes succeed, then not only does it vote with a verified plus or minus two, which is like a verified plus or minus one, but more so, um, but it also uh, tells Garrett to submit the change. Submit is Garrett speak for actually perform this merge. Um, the post-merge pipeline, uh, again, is very similar. We're back to the, oh, sorry. Uh, so you, yeah, I've got a question yeah. about that. Um, is that your actual config? Um, this is really, it it, it's fairly close. I'll show you the, the question is, is this the actual config? Uh, the actual config has a longer description that fits that doesn't fit on the slide. Um, we we have a, an extra thing that lets you trigger something with a recheck uh, or re-verify comment, um, but other than that, that's that's basically it. Um, all right. Uh, and uh, the other thing I didn't mention is here we say it's a dependent pipeline manager because. Uh, this time we do want Zool to do the thing where it uh, queues changes up and does the speculative execution work. Um, so in post, we're back to independent pipelines um, where basically when, when there's a ref updated event from Garrett uh, that matches this regular expression, that means that something has merged to a branch. And in that case, we want to build the documentation for that branch and build a, a branch tip tarball uh, as well. Um, Experimental pipeline, again, this is something that we just uh, came up with out of uh, and, and built out of these primitives that we already had. Um, here, the, the trigger is, um, is somebody actually leaving a comment, and, and this is uh, like the thing that I glossed over in the, the gate pipeline. So if somebody leaves a comment with the words uh, check experimental in it, then that means that uh, Zool will enqueue uh, the changes in the experimental pipeline. So basically, this means that it's now an on-demand pipeline. It's an easy way for developers to request that changes, uh, that tests run for this particular change. But otherwise, they won't run. Um, and when it reports back to Garrett, it doesn't vote. Uh, all it does is it actually just leaves a message in, in Garrett. Uh, no, I don't want the manager. Oh. Yeah. Then I've, I've uh, the question is, hey, it doesn't have a manager. And probably the answer is I simplified it too much on the slide. Um, so, yeah. Uh, 
Yes, it, it, it really should have a manager. Um, Yep, there it is. That's got one. Um, I, I think Zool even now has um, syntax checking. So uh, if I ran this through Zool, um, uh, it, it should actually tell me, like, hey, I kind of need a manager. Um, uh, the silent pipeline, I, like I mentioned earlier, uh, it just runs anytime um, a patch is uploaded, but then it doesn't report at all. Uh, so basically what we're going to do here is is go and find the results ourselves manually some way, or just look at aggregate um, uh, results. Like uh, Zool will send uh, uh, statistics to Graphite via StatsD, so we can go look at the graph for a change and and see like oh well this or, sorry the graph for a, a test, and we can see that this uh, this test always fails, so it's clearly not ready for prime time yet. Um, Here's our release pipelines. Um, the, the regular expression gets a little bit more complicated because we're um, writing Python. Uh, and so, of course, the regular expression for a Python, a final Python version number is, is, uh, runs off the screen. Um, but uh, basically what this is looking for is somebody pushing a tag that looks like a version number. And uh, so when, whenever somebody uh, tags the repository and pushes that, then we start building a release based on that. And we actually have some really nifty automation that means that you don't have to do things like commit version numbers to your repository. Um, we actually just build the, the project with the, the tag that you've pushed as the version. Uh, and all of that's triggered by, by this. Our periodic pipeline um, is basically it just runs on a timer. Um, so early every morning we kick off a bunch of jobs. Um, it's recently, um, thanks to Joshua Hesketh, grown the ability to send email. Um, it hasn't grown the, the ability to read email, which means it's not, as a program, it's not feature complete yet. But, <laughs> but it can send email. Um, and so this is, uh, this is actually what we're doing now as of a couple weeks ago. Um, we stopped using Jenkins, uh, Jenkins' ability to send mail uh, because what, what it would do is send you uh, a piece of mail that said, this job fa failed and then it would send you a couple hundred lines out of the 10,000 lines of output from that job, which basically was more or less context-free. Uh, that's, that's pretty useless to get something like that in email. And then it would do that for every job that failed. So you'd end up with a bunch of, uh, of emails. Here, with this, what we get is, is an, email that, uh, an email that looks um, almost exactly like uh, what I showed you in Garrett with the, the list of jobs that have run, um, whether they succeeded or failed, and those, uh, and then clickable links to the logs for all of this. So you get a, a summary report every day of all of the jobs that run. Um, so uh, I think it's uh, a lot more useful for uh, folks like our stable branch maintainers. So Zool queues that up, but at the time it looks suspiciously like a cron has failed. Yes. Um, it is not actually using cron, it's just using the, the, the syntax. So the question was, was does Zool do this? And I think the Im implication was, or are we just passing that to cron? And the answer is, is that Zool is doing it. Um, we just use the cron uh, syntax because uh, everybody knows it um, or knows where the man page is. Actually, probably, I don't know. I, I don't know it, I, I admit, I, I just know where the man page is. Um, so, so anyway, I've already shown you our actual full uh, Zool configuration, um, but, um, uh, well, actually, I didn't show you this part. So this is uh, how we actually configure a project. So um, the, for instance, for Nova, um, we've got all of these uh, pipelines that I mentioned earlier. And then we just say uh, whenever, whenever a change for Nova gets enqueued in one of these pipelines, run these jobs. Uh, so whenever, something, um, whenever somebody uploads a patch set for Nova, that's going to hit the check pipeline. So it's going to run the pep8, the docs, and the Python 2.7 jobs, and then the Tempest dev stack job. It's actually quite a bit longer than this. So I'm, I'm, uh, at this point, we run a lot of jobs. But this gives you the, the general flavor. And then we just um, you know, repeat this for, uh, for all of the projects that we have. There's a templating system in the configuration as file as well. So if you're running a project with um, 20 projects that all behave about the same, you can template some of this stuff out uh, and avoid repetition. Um, 
And as I mentioned earlier, uh, projects that share a job uh, automatically uh, get a shared change queue. So here we've got two projects, Nova and Glance, and because they they share the Gate Tempest DevStack VM job, that means that Nova is going to combine those into a, a shared queue. If they didn't, then actually their gates would be separate, and um, a change to Glance wouldn't have to wait for a change to Nova to merge. Uh, I've already shown you the status view. Um, so one of the things we've done recently with Zool is, um, is to make it so that it's not quite as tightly tied to Jenkins uh, as it was originally. So um, you can actually use Gearman, which is a, a fairly simple uh, job distribution system. Um, it's a very lightweight protocol. Um, and you can have Zool uh, basically submit requests um, to Gearman. It puts jobs on the Gearman queue and then something on the other end can pick up those jobs. We have a Gearman plugin for Jenkins, so uh, that means our Jenkins uses Gearman to pick up these jobs and run them. But uh, you can, uh, it's, it's a pretty simple protocol. You can write your own worker. Uh, you can use something called Turbo Hipster, which um, Joshua Hesketh wrote and uh, Michael claims credit for when he speaks about it at conferences. And, um, <laughs> Uh, they're actually using it um, with a, a Zool to run the database migration tests uh, for Nova. Um, so, so anyway, Zool, Zool is becoming um, agnostic about what runs its jobs. It just cares that they get run. Um, and, um, and yeah, so it's, it's basically, it's pretty easy to, to, to hook up anything to the other end of Zool. Um, there's... Uh, as you might have sort of inferred, there's, uh, there are now two reporters for uh, Zool. There's reporting back to Garrett, and then there's reporting over email. This is also a pluggable thing, so if you have something else you would like to report to, uh, I don't know, report over SMS or, or to, I don't know, some other project management website that people may or may not use, uh, that's also a pluggable system, so you can, you can write something that, that hooks into that. Uh, the triggers are pluggable as well. Um, we have two triggers, the Garrett trigger and the timer trigger. Um, but again, that's something that you could integrate with other systems if you felt the need. And um, people have expressed interest in integrating this with GitHub, um, but it hasn't been written yet. If, if you'd like to, um, we'd certainly accept that patch. Uh, if in case it needs saying, this is all uh, free software. Um, it's under the Apache license. You can get it from um, git.openstack.org. Um, it's got bugs on Launchpad, docs on our doc site. We hang out in the OpenStack Infra channel on Freenode, and we love to talk about this stuff. And uh, there's a mailing list um, that you can subscribe to as well. And uh, these slides uh, are available at a better URL than this. Oops. Um, anyway, they're at docs.openstack.org slash infra slash publications. Um, so uh, I think we might have just a little bit of time for questions, if there are any uh, that didn't get answered already. All right, cool. Thanks. Oh, sorry. Oh, yes. Why Zool? Um, because it's a gatekeeper. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Joshua. Uh, have you given much thought to a modern master Zool? Um, have I given much thought to a multi master Zool? Yes, I have. Uh, I have given that some thought. Um, the the complicated thing is that um, its main function is around uh, making decisions. Um, and, and so uh, distributing decision making about a single entity is, 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 a, <laughs> right, is a complicated problem. I, I think it's probably doable, um, but uh, I think there are actually other things that we can do to deal with scaling in the short term. And one of those I actually just published to the, to the mailing list about. Um, moving a lot of the work that Zool does out into workers, so it's strictly decision making. Um, that at least gets us very far down the road in terms of scalability. Uh, you still might want uh, multi-master Zool for HA reasons or things like that, but uh, we run it on the cloud, and of course the cloud is always up, so. 
<laughs> Do we have any more time? If so, question in the back. Uh, I don't believe anybody has, uh, I haven't heard about anybody expressing interest in that. Uh, I think it's possible and we could probably accept it. Zool already runs uh, a tiny web server just to serve the status information. Um, if, if it starts doing anything more than, than spitting out read-only JSON, uh, it might need to actually start using a real web server with a real Python web framework. Um, Oh, yes. Oh, so the DMN can go in still? Modern Zool has come with a command line client that will let you go in the command line. So the, the reason, the reason uh, I brought up the post question was because of the comment about GitHub earlier. Mm -hmm. And so GitHub, Bitbucket, all of those, one of the easiest things to set up for integration from them is just the post, the post hook on your repo, hmm. where it will go hit the URL with whatever payload you tell it to send. Yep. Um, Thank you. Um, thank you very much, James. It's